Lexner watching Build Series Sydney. Now today I'm joined by some very special cast members from Danger Close, The Battle of Wong Tan. But before we meet them, let's check out a trailer. Woo! Give it up for Nicholas Hamilton and Daniel Webber. How are you feeling? Good. Feeling good. What yeah, pretty, is it pretty like pumped. to see that? Is that like deja vu? Is that bizarre seeing yourself reflected back at you on screen? Uh, it's a fantastic trailer. That's why every time <laughs> I see it, it's it's awesome. Like it just show it tells the story so well. Doesn't reveal anything. It's heavy and full on. I love it. I really do. And it's nice because it's something that uh, we're, we're a part of something that I think is important. It's got a lot of value, a lot of meaning, a lot of significance. And um, yeah, seeing the trailer kind of brings that home again. Mm. And similarly, you were at the premiere for this film yesterday. How was it feeling? How was it like to like finally release it to the world and see everybody's reactions and almost, again, experience it through somebody else's lens? It was special. I mean, that's not only were we watching it with audience members, we were watching it with vets, mm -hmm. um, some who were in the battle, uh, which is just nuts. I mean, and having that, I mean, throughout filming, we were trying to respect the story and honour the story as much as possible and honour these guys who went through this and just to have that validation of... of having them watch it and give you kind words after it, it just it means a lot. Um, so it was special, it was a very special night and I'm glad I'm glad I was there. You feel the same? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're like yeah, locked same, eyes for a second, do you feel yeah. that way? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, get, getting, yeah, we made this film for them for the, to get the recognition that they've deserved. Yeah. Um, this happened, you know, 50 years ago and it's a story that I think a lot of Australians aren't aware of. And I mean, I, I've, I've known about this for about 10 years because the project's been in development for that long. Um, but before that, I'd, I'd never studied this part of the Vietnam War at school. I'd, I'd never heard of the battle. Um, so for them to have their story told and to have that recognition, uh, I, th I think it's uh, something that they very much wanted and needed and deserved. Mm. Were you familiar with the script when it came through? Uh, not with the story, no. So I, um, I mean, I just graduated high school. And that was, I mean, it's one of the things that drew me into the, to the, to the story, into the script, into the movie, is that... Literally just graduated high school and hadn't heard an ounce about this story and it's such an incredible story and it needs to be heard by everyone. Um, which is why I'm glad this movie was made and everyone needs to see it because it's just... Australians should be proud of this story and proud of all the boys that were involved. Um, and they weren't given recognition by the Australian government for f until 45 years after the actual battle happened, which is just nuts. And we need to respect these boys while they're still alive mm. and uh, really honour them and... That's why people, by viewing this movie and really understanding the story, I think we'll do that. Mm. Yeah, and it's shocking because it's, it's is one of the most significant battles of Vietnam War for Australian soldiers. I mean, it's a battle we, we lost the most amount of men in, um, but it's also a decisive um, survive, you know, victory and success for, for the men. Like, it was such overwhelming odds. It was 105, uh, 100, 108 all up Australian New Zealanders against, uh, th they estimate to like t about 2,000, 2000 yeah, North yeah. Vietnamese. Um, so it's, it's this extraordinary survival story for these young guys, you know, these guys are, uh, like Nick plays a guy who's, who was 19 when he was over there and I th the, the main age is like 19, 20, 21, 22. Mm. Um, I play Paul Large and he, he turned 21 the day he left. So they're all these, these young, young guys going through this extraordinary experience and sort of the bravery and the courage and the friendship that you know, they, they had to display throughout this period. It was mm. exceptional. Was it bizarre feeling or knowing that at this age, in a different time, that could have actually been you and trying to wrap your head around that while playing the character or playing the person, sorry? A hundred percent. I mean, I, I turned 18 uh, just before we started filming. So, I mean, it's just, it's talking to my parents and talking to everyone and just who has kids about their young kids going into battle, conscripted into battle. Um, now it would just be it's just it's nuts to think of i mean i've i'm in no position to uh, even hold a gun let alone go into into battle it's just nuts to um i mean it's i've talked to uh, many veterans and it's just it's that the over overwhelming feeling of when you're going in especially if you're conscripted just you're not prepared you're not yeah. ready and you're young you just left school or you're still in school and conscripted into the army it's just it's <coughs> I don't know, there's something wrong about it. Um, luckily, I mean, this movie touches on uh, a lot of uh, sort of brothership and, and, and mateship that you have to have with all these young guys. They all have to be brothers in, in the battle and in war so you can, you can have that shoulder to lean on um, and a shoulder to cry on when need be. 
Mm. How do you mentally prepare for something like this? Because obviously when you're preparing for other films, you're playing a character, you know, in a hypothetical role. But being in this position, knowing that you are enacting somebody's life, it's much more than, oh, let me just like, you know, turn on a fake tear. How did you, yeah, how did you prepare for that? It, it kind of, you know, the, everybody has their individual journeys and characters in the story, but I think w one of the, the main themes that comes through in the film and I think probably helped the men get through it is the team building and the camaraderie that they shared. Yeah. Um, and I, I, that started for uh, like our first day, the first day I met Nick, we, we sort of share a through line throughout the film. And the first day we met, we were in a boot camp together and we were, you know, doing formation training. We were learning about the battle and, you know, talking about the characters and our journeys and trying to figure it out. So we were instantly thrown into a situation where we had to bond, where we had to get to know each other and, and, and really rely on each other and help each other along this, you know, understand the battle and understand the process. Mm. Did it work out? Have you, have you bonded? Oh, well, it's a work in progress, <laughs> we know. I'm sensing some tension. <laughs> it's been about 14 months, we're still working on <laughs> it. We're getting there, yeah, we're, getting we're getting there. there. We'll get there. Boot camp. Is this physical, like we're, we're in the trenches, we're doing, you know, we're picking up guns, we're picking up sacks of sand or what more, was boot more, camp like? More conceptual and yeah. uh, as far as learning the battle because the battle field was so complex mm -hmm. and reading the script, is, uh, it's so detailed and trying to understand it is quite tricky on paper. And so with this extraordinary military advisor, John Isles, who went through like minute by minute of what happened, why it happened, the decisions that probably got made and... And then also just like in, in introducing us to the Australian culture at that time and teaching us about, you know, the guys at Nui Dad at the base and how the base was formed and, and starting to give us the insight into the military culture there. Mm. Yeah, just trying to understand it. It was a lot of the technical work was learn, you know, reloading a gun and that's, I mean, as you said, like learning the formations and stuff is only so much you can do. We had a week of boot camp, so it was just a week of basically every night going out for a beer and just trying to learn these guys and... and uh, learn who you're going to stand next to. I mean, I had to, I had to become really good mates with, with Dan because um, uh, we share a through line and we're basically little brother, big brother throughout the whole film. Um, but yeah, all the boys had to really just know each other because we were th thrown into this thing pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, we had to learn all the technical stuff, but it was really mainly about, because the underlying thing is just mateship throughout the whole movie, so we had to learn each other. Yeah. yeah we, we'd go out, we'd, we were living living in the same hotel, um, we would go out and have dinners and beers and, you know, spend spend time together and get to know each other that way and, you know, like, Nick had his 18th birthday, I th think the first or second day that we got to know, like, so we, yeah. we had these really powerful bonding moments and time, it was a, it was a very, um, there was a lot that happened in that week period of time before we jumped on set and sort of the cameras were rolling. And how was it celebrating your birthday on set? I think it 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 brought a lot to us becoming mates. I mean, mm -hmm. that's it was the first. So our first day at boot camp was the day before my birthday. So that night we all went out, and that midnight was the big like thing. So you had a loose one. Yeah, yeah it was loose. <laughs> you could say that. We helped him home. We helped basically. Yeah. Verbatim. We, yeah, we were, we were good mates. <laughs> yeah, there's a plenty of stories from that night. But that's like I think it I think it brought a lot to us. I mean. Uh, Bracey and Sammy Parsons and Alex England and just all the boys just there. We were learning everything about each other, but also just being blokes and uh, I know just being just learning how to be mates um, with each other and and help each other out. And that's that night helping me home and helping oh. a couple of guys home. It's just like learning how to stand up for each other. Um, it's a funny story about uh, Alex England standing up for a few guys who were because we're in quite small towns, right? Um, and uh, Alex and Lynn stood up to some guys who were being dicks to some younger blokes uh, in the cast, and Alex stood up and went, Alex. Scared the guys away. It's fantastic. He's a very big guy, He's a guy, very big Alex. man. He's so like seven I foot. Like, when, when, yeah, yeah, when, yeah, <laughs> He's like seven when, foot. When a big guy just says, Alex. Yeah. I've got to try To that. you, you go, oh, actually, maybe I'll Yeah, maybe I'll piss back off. off. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that was, I mean, it's just everyone standing up for each other, and that's the whole thing about the battle, just having the guy beside his back. And this is such an ensemble, like this film really is an ensemble mm. and we have so many talented, bloody great young actors on board of this film. I mean, uh, for, I don't know if you have, but I've, I've known some of these guys for about 10 years or so, like since, I've, you know, in we'll see each other at auditions or go out, you know, like, and so it was, for me, I got to work with friends, like people that I, I 
love already, mm. um, which is a real treat. And I think I don't know, ad- added to to just fast tracking that process. Absolutely. I would love for you to paint me a picture about what it was really like on set when you're filming these hectic battle sequences. Are you hearing like bombs go off? Are you hearing gunshots? Is it like duck for cover? Or is it much more uh, of an intuitive process? A bit of both. Mm. Um, there's We know that uh, Creve had like a megaphone like PA system over the whole thing. So if anything had to happen, um, if we had to be drop bombs or there was guys shooting at us, he would tell us over the PA. Could you do your best imitation? Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, no pressure. There, there was one, there's one <laughs> thing that he said. Um, Sorry, Chris. At some, point during, at some point during the story, uh, some fighter jets fly over us. Yeah. So he'd, um, he'd yell out, we're in the middle and we're meant to look up whenever he says jets. Great. So he'd, uh, he'd be in the middle of a scene really serious and he'd be go, and jets. That's, that's your cue. <laughs> <laughs> just keeping a straight face through all that and also saying jets remind everyone of jimmy and the jets so he'd say as uh, um he'd be like and jets and everyone would go <laughs> <laughs> just shit like that but the, um, the other thing is he'd forget that he was on the microphone so he'd finish <laughs> a take and he'd be like ah oh, damn it huh? ah. <laughs> and you go, oh, oh, sorry, no, um, no, it was really, really good. Um, we're just gonna go for, for one more take, all right? Just one more take, all right, boys. He's like trash, and he's like, no, 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 not, not you. Still on the mic, crib. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit of both. So we had also, I mean, you'd have these uh, takes where they'd be obviously on your face, and you're pretending to shoot these guys, and you're in rain and mud, and that'd be for about half the day, and then they would turn around and they'd have the North Vietnamese running at you. And you realise what you've been shooting at? Mm. They're coming out of the mist and out through the trees. Basically. So you, ha- you can't even see these guys um, until they're 20 metres away. You so can hear them. So it felt that way in real life as well? Yeah. It's, you, it's only you, you realise then how You're actually terrifying it is. You're laying prone on the ground. Oh, my god. Because you realise, I mean, you, that's what you've been shooting at for the last half a day. And you don't have an actual target. And then they turn around and they have over your shoulder seeing these guys just screaming and, and shooting and, and yelling at you. It's just... Mm. Absolutely terrifying hearing the trumpets go off. It's just nuts. Really, really and terrifying. With the stunt work, sometimes they would be running full tilt at, at you and they've got wires. So when they get within like half a meter of you, somebody yanks them back. So you don't, you're just praying that the person pulling pulls them at the right time and you don't get collected by this very burly, stu- you know, <laughs> Vietnamese stunt. Collected, just like clothes lined. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. So do you resonate with your characters at all? Because you your character is quite defiant and noble and yours was quite sort of felt like he didn't he was frightened, mm-hmm. didn't feel like he was in the right place. Was it easy to kind of sit into those characters or quite difficult? I mean, for me, Paul reminded me of an amalgam of a bunch of young Aussie blokes, like farm farm dudes that I knew, like mm. just very, you know, quiet and reserved, but also just have that resilience and strength and confidence um you know the sort of guy that can just pull an engine apart that wants to go and have a beer with his mates yeah. and loves his football mm. so i felt like i'd grown up with <clears throat> with paul large i mean i would he's somebody that i would love to go and have a beer with you know i, I just felt he's he's very easily accessible to me and then i was lucky enough that they gave me a, a bunch of his letters that he wrote back to his family um while he was over there and they were a really big insight into who he was and his his personality and his humor and he's very he's a very funny guy. I mean, there was one thing that he wrote back to his mum uh, saying he wished he'd brought a giant toothbrush over with him. So when the Viet- Vietnamese saw him with this giant toothbrush, he, they'd they'd be so scared that the Aussie blokes are so bloody huge. <laughs> you know, they must they must be huge if they've got these t- t- toothbrushes. You know, he just had a funny sense of humor, like wanting to to get his mum to send beer across because he couldn't stand the American beer. But he was never going to say no to the American beer either. Oh, you know what I mean? No, of course not. <laughs> just, just a really, oh, yeah, very okay. accessible and uh, yeah. really fun. And, you know, uh, also, yeah, like you said, independent and quite quite a rebel. Like he definitely yeah. had a, a point of view on how people were running the war and, you know, people in charge telling him what to do and what he thought about it. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm a little brother myself. So I, I always felt like that was... Um, because it basically Grimes is basically the whole story just is taken care of by Largy in a slight way. <laughs> um, 
just always has him by his side and he acts like his big brother and the whole 12th platoon is just big brothers to him because he was the youngest in 12th platoon. Um, so yeah, I resonate with that. It's just having that weak point that you just always have to be, no matter how young you are in that battle, you always have to be on and focused, otherwise bad things happen. Mm. Give me um, the lowdown. What was it like to work with Luke and Travis? I mean, they're both legends. I mean, Bra <laughs> Bracey um, was one of the first ones I talked to uh, at boot camp and he was the one who I said, I kind of very shyly said it was my birthday tomorrow. Oh. And he sort of organised the whole thing and was one of the ones that just kept loading me up with different alcohols. <laughs> um, great guy, great guy. Great guy. I mean, I mean and uh, him and Trav, just the, the pair of them are just fantastic, fantastic guys. Just very casual and chill and easy to work with. Mm. That's the whole cast, really. It's just there's no ego on this set. There was no one who you couldn't stand being around. Everyone was just a good guy who wanted to get the job done, mm. truly. Yeah, and when Trav, Trav came in too, we we'd, all of us boys had done the boot camp together for the week. And while we were doing our boot camp, he was over in Perth uh, working with the S, uh, SAS doing training there. And so we we were all kind of in awe. I mean, we were also, I think we all res also respected him as, a, as an actor. Um, but for the situation, what, like the film we're telling, he was getting some really great training and we were all a little bit... I think in awe of, of that. And so we were very curious to see who would come in. So he, he, he came in with a lot of gravitas just from that. And then, yeah. like, like Nick said, he's just such an, they're, they're both so accessible and yeah. they're, they're practical jokers too. <laughs> you know, like it, it was, we had a lot of fun on set. Like it's, it's a very serious film and, you know, we're in the mud and we're in the cold. And, um, but it's such good people on board and we it was it was so enjoyable and 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 travis is always he's a practical joker so he's always at, at each other you know <laughs> at all of us but it, in a way that was trying to develop the camaraderie and right. the, the bond that these boys had to have yeah, 100%. that's method acting isn't it <laughs> yeah i don't think he would say that, <laughs> no, say that. <laughs> so serious question yes how are you sleeping at night Right. Because oh. coming from this, and then a movie like it, ah, it's got to be it's got to be tense up there. It's got to be nightmares on nightmares. I just want to know what's going on. It's rough. Um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, I mean it's um, the thing about working on both of those projects is like as we said, both projects had a cast that, after cut was said, was back to jokes and was back to normal mm. guys and just blokes who had. I just like to have fun. Um, I still have a group chat with the with the kids and I have a group chat with these boys that just like, it's constant how it was on set, just jokes and fun and wanting to have a beer and just hang out and, and chat. So it made everything easier. I mean, when you wake up at 3.30 in the morning for something like this and go to set to be showered on with cold rain and have trench clothes and laying in the mud, which is nothing compared to what the actual guys went through, so we can't complain. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's nice to have those guys by your side who are going through it with you and will carry you through it. Um, that was the same thing with it. Uh, sort of going up against a menacing clown or even my character trying to uh, carve a, an H into this kid's stomach. Um, it just helps to have that kid after the end of the scene, after he's crying and screaming, after cut is yelled. He's like, oh, that was really good. Yeah, thanks, mate. Appreciate <laughs> it. That was really good. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. It's just helpful rather than having someone who's going to continue to cry or just be... I mean, there's no dra there was no drama on any of those sets. Oh, good. True, truly. And also, I'm not going to say I was disappointed not to see you in a mullet, but <laughs> seeing you in the Motley crew or seeing the trailer, how was it transitioning from being a private, being stoic, to being on stage, moving and swaying your hips around? I mean, it was intense. <laughs> it was a big... I, I, f I started shooting... Um, this a week after we finished, after we wrapped on the Damn. dirt. So it was a, it was a very fast turnaround. Um, fortunately, I would known about this for a while, so I was sort of a bit grounded in the story and, you know, about Paul and whatnot. But um, yeah, it was a bit of bapt baptism by fire. It was nice to sort of mm. jump straight into the boot camp. That sort of helped things. But um, yeah, I don't know. They're very, very different Absolutely. human beings. Um, yeah, I, d I don't know. It uh, to be honest, it we we shot for three months in New Orleans, and it was a it was a very exhausting experience mm. it was a 
it was ex an extraordinary experience getting up on stage and singing and playing and um, you know telling those guys story but coming coming to this and coming back home um, telling you know a, a very Australian story um, with with people that I, I love and you know uh, who have the same sensibility and you know uh, that that was like a, a real treat mm. you know to come back to have you always been a good singer no <laughs> my grandparents grew up you know they used to sing on the radio but um no I, I had to train for it right yeah and you do some singing as well don't you uh, yeah I can yeah a little bit you dabble. I dabble. We've seen a few videos. I dabble a little bit. <laughs> Will you be releasing any original stuff? I'm working on it, yeah. I mean, yeah. I've been, so I've been living in LA for six months now, and it's basically just been auditions and writing. Um, got a writing partner, uh, Ben Cool, who lives in Ballina with me. Um, he lived in Ballina with me. Very strong guitarist, and that's I write my songs with him. It's just it's a lot about life and stuff. But, yeah, hopefully soon we're going to go up to New York and put some stuff down. So maybe like a 2019 drop. I just want to know when oh to get excited. I'd say 2020. Don't get your hopes up. 2020. 2020. Drop maybe a get your hopes up. Drop a beat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want to do a little something-something? Oh, God. Really? I would beatbox and I'm terrible. <laughs> I could try. DJ for me. Do it. Okay. Five, six, seven, eight. Dim, 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 dim. <laughs> Look, there was something there. That was, was like a there. It was a rumbling bass line. I really enjoyed and that. And I would have done the highs as Drop well. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I meant to ask you, how is it wearing heels? <laughs> oh, right. I mean, I <laughs> these aren't heels. No. You can't point at these and say they're these heels. These aren't heels. No, for, she's talking about the, the Motley Crue film. I mean, it's, uh, it's, I, I don't know how I don't have broken ankles. Um, I remember at one point doing this. We were doing the, uh, the Looks to Kill music video and Vince does lots of spins with his mic, you know, with the mic stand. Yeah. So I remember doing this big spin and I just remember my left foot just going whoosh, up off the ground. Oh. Just leaving the ground and then I'm pirouetting, <laughs> pirouetting on, <laughs> on one form. heel and these heels are like four inch heels um, and just going, this is, this is the end. <laughs> it's all over now. Um, and I somehow stuck it and we kept going on with the take. But um, yeah, no, it's, uh, I take my hat off to anybody out there wearing heels because they're not easy. It's like stilts on a day to day. It's like the, the ankle support is the thing that gets you. But, you know, it's a conversation for another time. Fortunately for me, I mean, I, that was pretty much the only time I had to do them was for the, this one uh, music video. Because Vince th in history got rid of his heels fairly early on. Um, and he'd wear racing racing shoes mm. and sprint across the stage. I mean, you just can't you can't do what he does in heels. You could. I mean, I think you could. The videos yeah, I saw on Instagram, I wouldn't even try that. I'm firmly planted on the ground. I'm in a sneaker at all times because you were just like one leg up. You were kicking. You were spinning. You were swaying your hips. So yeah, I was tapping into something. That's not me. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know how to do that. I, had, I think I had to just... That was Vince carrying me through. That was like wig on, you know, Just heel on. Fluke. The whole <laughs> thing was a fluke. <laughs> so what do you both have coming up? What can we look forward to? Uh, well, It Chapter 2 comes out uh, in Australia September 5th, mm -hmm. uh, September 6th in the States. Um, I'm excited for that. I haven't seen it yet or, or really read any scripts or anything. I'm just I'm going to watch it with the rest of everyone. Um, got another, like, romance thing coming out. Ooh. Maybe next, start next year, end of this year. Um I just signed another job too, so I'm been very lucky. Very Booked lately. and busy. Booked and busy. <laughs> it's the way to work. Yeah. Way to work. And what about you? Uh, I just finished a film in South Australia, which was a really great experience. It's a it's a South African story. Um, so it's myself and Dan Radcliffe, and it's a true story about these two guys in 1978 during the apartheid. Uh, they would go out as part of the ANC, and they would try and raise awareness for the, the country essentially uh, against, you know, standing against the, the system and the regime and uh, they would let off these letter bombs with propaganda on them and these uh, giant banners off the side of buildings. And they end up getting caught after about four years of doing this and they get sentenced for 12 years in prison. D Tim gets 12 and Stephen, who I play, uh, got eight. Oof. And so it's a story about these guys who get, these two, two white guys who get put in prison um, and eventually break out of the, the the prison, they they find a way to, to make keys and get out of prison. Is that a spoiler? Or try to. Well, I mean, it's a prison break film. <laughs> <laughs> you like, so they get keys and then they break out. I never said they got next. away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Awesome. We have a, a few questions from the audience members. They're very good, but we'll start very light and easy. This is from Shah. 
Dan, what's it like living in LA? Um, it's I, I'd say it's fairly similar to, to Sydney, mm. uh, myself, just not as nice. Um, and no beach right there. Um, no, I love it. I mean, uh, I've, I've been there for five years now, so... Um, and just as an actor, it's sort of the, the place to be, you know, LA, LA or New York. Um, I've got a lot of good, good friends and good people there, and I think... I think it might be a tough time if you don't have that, if you mm. don't have uh, your people. And uh, I'm just lucky that I do. I've got you know, people that I love. And Nick's over there now as well, like a couple of boys who, who are on this shoot. Um, and so you, you, your circle slowly grows bigger and bigger. Yeah. And um, yeah. So had you met before filming Danger Close? Since no, not us two. No, right. it's, I, so I'd, while filming, I was still home. Um, no, I'd met, I don't think I'd met anyone uh, on, on this, which was cool. I mean, I was just truly trying to, Build relationships from the start. Um, I know you met a couple of the boys, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, I've, I've been, uh, yeah, I've been friends with a few of the boys, um, and it was just a great experience to, you know, because I've respected a lot of these guys mm. as actors for years, and 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 yeah, got to know them. So it was, just, it's just a pleasure to work with people you you already have that. Yeah. It's just one less thing to try and develop on set because you you're thrown into very intimate situations. Mm often in, in um, making films for, and you have to have relationships like that. And uh, it's nice to not have to force anything. It's, it was just there. Was it because of Home and Away that you knew a few of the other guys or? <laughs> no. Okay, I was gonna say, I'm like, how, how, you, how, did, how did you know them? Just from like industry No, just things? from, I mean, I, I think I'd done workshops with a few of the boys. I'd seen, I, I'd worked with them in different different sessions and mm -hmm. um, recording booths and I mean, just, just I mean, we'd been working in the same, you know, in Sydney. It's a small town. Small and world, yeah. So yeah, so just got to know them. Um, same age group too. Mm. So you're often up for the same parts, seeing them at auditions and, mm. yeah, just that. Sick. Another question for Nick. What was it like working with Vigo on set of Captain Fantastic? Oh, lovely. Yeah. Absolutely lovely. Vigo's an absolute legend. Um, so I did a movie called Captain Fantastic where Vigo plays basically the father of six kids and they live off the grid in uh, the forests of Washington State. Mm. Um, so Vigo basically had to be a father to us six kids uh, on set. And he did that fantastically. He's just a very gentle, kind human yeah. being, very intellectual, very smart, uh, very talented, an incredibly talented actor. Um, and basically shaped all of us kids. And he continues to, I mean, we, have, well, we all have an email chain now where he talks to um, I was the third youngest of the six um, and we all just continue to talk and he keeps giving us advice and he's just honestly an absolute legend. That shoot was incredible. I love that. I love that it's also an email chain as well. Because he's off the grid. He's t he is off the grid. He has a flip phone and he lives in the forests of somewhere. He's just, Oof. yeah, he's a <laughs> very off the grid guy. I mean, he did Lord of the Rings and has all the money in the world and can basically do whatever he wants mm. now. Uh, which is his life is just he doesn't really need to be in the spotlight and he does well with it. Do you reckon you could do that? Live off the grid? Not right now. Yeah, I think <laughs> I'm very like attached to my phone. Very attached to my phone. Yeah, um, give me off the grid. I want off the grid. That'd be yeah. great. Oh, for real? Oh, hell yes. Yeah, go for it. Where Send would me you up go? to Oregon or Utah or, do it. or Wyoming. Yeah. Hell yes. Would you do like a shack life or like a van life? <laughs> Ooh, I th maybe van life. A bit mm -hmm. of, yeah, keep on the road, keep traveling. Side note, there are some great YouTube videos about how people live in vans, like how they shower, how they get around, where they get their mail. A additional learning. Okay. You'll get into yeah. that. <laughs> also, another question from Dan. Uh, for Dan, sorry. You've done a couple of projects where you're playing a real-life person. Is there a big difference in how you prepare for when you're playing a fictional character? Um, yes and no. I mean... There's much more weight to something when it's a real person, so you have much more responsibility. Uh, often there's more more to research, like so you have a clearer clearer picture of who this person was. Um, so for example, we like Vince Neil. There's so much footage of him online. Like there was almost too much information out there, um, so you can get lost in that. Uh, yeah, with with uh, when you're not uh, working a real person, you just have to create it. You have, which is also a great process. Um, and it's it's about you filling in the blanks and going okay. So what? Wh wh who was this person prior to this film? As as a young man growing up, what sort of shaped him and formed him? And what are those sort of influencing factors? And um, yeah, just just yeah, you just have to create it, which is a, a joy. Mm. And how intricate do you go? Are you thinking like you know? Was he allergic to asparagus? How would he react to that? Does he have like, you know, weird finger movements? Or is it purely like, how is this person mentally shaping themselves? 
I mean, yeah, it's for me. I, I think I always start with the the sort of the psychology of of the person, and I think you know we're all shaped in the fam with our families and our you know mothers and fathers, and I think that's that that's a huge part of w often where it, it seems to end up for me of just like yeah, what was that relationship and how did that shape him and who is he because of this? Um, mm. So starting there, but yeah, I mean there. Y it's essentially whatever is going to fuel you as as the actor and sort of make you, you know, more present and more ready to to work opposite somebody else. Mm, do you have a similar process? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's much difference to. I mean, if if you're treating a fictional fictional character, you still have to learn, as you said, like what happened before them and what's going to happen after, who they are as as a character, mm. how they were written, rather than how they were like born and and their actual personality in real life. I think it's very similar. I um, think if you're going to compare someone like uh, Noel Grimes where there's actual stories of him and there's interviews and you can gauge that, like what he sounds like and what he acts like and um, interviews of, of Grimes, he still like acts like the little brother of the whole thing and he's in his 50s now, I guess, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, some that <coughs> compared to Henry Bowers, like it's just like there's still, like he had an abusive uh family i mean his so the book obviously you pull a lot from that because a lot of the book isn't in the movie so yeah. book tells about how his mum left him and his dad when he was a kid and that's what made his dad abusive and it's just all the little details that you're going to put into place that make your character more special yeah. absolutely rogue question but i have to ask mm -hmm. if someone was playing you as a character what is the one integral thing that they would have to consider shit um the Jesus. nose the nose, probably. <laughs> the nose, you got to keep that ski slope. The nose, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's... Good luck. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> There's not much out there. Um, <laughs> I, I actually got the opportunity kind of to have that. I So in It too, um there is someone who plays the adult Henry Bowers. Mm. So it's... I had to almost... So his name's Teach. And I had to sort of talk to him and he had to sort of basically watch me and watch it over and over again just mm. to see mannerisms and stuff. And that's interesting for me to watch, to see someone actually research me in a weird way yeah. and see what, how you act because they have to be perfect. Absolutely. Um, and I saw all the adult losers do that for all the kids in um, yeah. uh, in it too. It's just really fascinating to see. Um, I think especially uh, Isaiah Mustafa plays the older Mike Hanlon. Um, he's played by Chosen Jacobs. And Chosen has a very specific accent, very... Uh, he says words and just, I mean, everyone does, you know, just a very um, interesting way. And, and Isaiah just perfectly nailed that. Mm. It's just, I think it's very fascinating to see it's not portraying a real person, but portraying someone else's portrayal of a different character. It's really interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. What would you say? It's a tricky one, but it's a good one to consider. It could happen sooner than you think. I cheaped out. I don't want to see that movie, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It's and not like on remember, the list. I'm I'm living off the grid. You know, I'm, this I'm is a true. Hiding, so. It's an into the wild vibe. Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah, eat yeah, the yeah, berries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Maybe that get some great scenery in the film. Okay, yeah. so it's some, more like a landscape. Yeah, get the landscape and the no dialogue. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got it. I might play the character just so you know. <laughs> All right, so this is a question for Nick. We've got heaps of good ones. I'm excited. Um, were you still at school when you were filming um, Danger Close, and did that make your role feel more real? I was still at school. So that's my last year of school was uh, 2018. So we were filming. I managed to film uh, three films last year. So I was, wasn't at school much, but I was I was in school. <laughs> um, yeah, there was just a lot. It was a lot more of the whole um, being treated like a little brother and then realising still that I was I could be this age and be thrown into battle. And it's just, there was, I was nowhere near ready. And I was, I'm a weak person. I think every actor has that little bit of just like we we play people for a living, we play dress up for a living. Yeah. So there's not much, I mean, that's just any actor, I think you can play a role like that, but you can't imagine being thrown into it. So yeah, it's being that young and being in school and having friends that I'd have to leave and having fr family that I'd have to leave, my parents especially, it gives you a whole new mindset and that definitely helped me throughout 100%. How do you logistically manage school when you're learning scripts it's like a bit of maths a bit of algebra yeah it was a little bit i mean when i was so you basically work on sets if you're still at school you work until you're 16 Rough. and then um after that you don't have to do school work on set i mean but movies like captain fantastic and the first it i was uh under 16 so i had to work um you'd have it's like there's worse hours on when you're under 18 it's like it's you can do two hours of 
work and then you have to do like an hour or half an hour of school work. It's just a messes with production, which is why you see movies like Riverdale where they're meant to be 17, 18 and they're like 25, 26. It's is just, this why? It's just easier. It's easy to work. Gossip, like Gossip Girl, I think they're like 28 when they're Absolutely filming. Absolutely, they work. Which is nuts. Which I mean, that's, yeah, that's just how it works because they can work as many hours as they want, oh. but they still look youngish. I want more insider oh. secrets. This is great. Yeah, that's about that it. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. I would have never considered that. Yeah, so it's about, I mean, that, that was what Captain Fantastic was like. Captain Fantastic was six kids, uh, I think five or four of us were under 18. Mm. So we had to have those breaks. We had a fantastic teacher, but saying, again, like it, there's all these kids are 14, 15 during mm. filming. It's just, it's continually like this. Um, you got to find a way to balance it. Uh, when you're not working, it is that balance of homework and scripts and mm. stuff. I mean, I did, living in such a small town, I did all my auditions basically from self tapes. So you'd do them at home and send them away. Um, so yeah, it's preparing for that and also preparing for tests. It's it's difficult, but you got to get it done <coughs> if you want to succeed. Meanwhile, I thought maybe kids can't remember lines that well, and that's why they get adults. Maybe not the case. Yeah, I mean, I be, uh, life experience too. With, yeah, with, with, with you know, you're, when you're when you're older, you, you you've just got a more resource to draw from. I think you know that that helps sometimes. I mean, sometimes it's like with our film, it's so great having people who are the actual age you know 19 yeah. year olds who are <coughs> experienced and and great actors but i think it's you know i, I think the trade-off is maybe if they're younger they're not as good potentially you know sometimes yeah i mean i think that's the stigma as well yeah. i think and yeah. we're overcoming that now i think it's uh something like it is yeah. making people see that kids can be fantastic actors and you don't have to get if you don't have to you don't have to get 25 year olds to play these kids just because of you know life experience i mean i can say now that i could probably with just the experience that I've had more in the industry, I could probably play the first Henry Bowers, like the 15-year-old Henry mm. Bowers, a little bit better just because of experience and stuff. But mm. um, then I did. But yeah, it's just, it's. I think we we are proving that kids can do as good of a job as, as adults, which is sick. Yeah, the kids. Yeah, the kids. <laughs> One more question. Sure. It is for you. Uh, <clears throat> they say you probably weren't on set on Home and Away at the same time, but did you guys all reminisce? Is there any of that happening? Oh no! Uh, the people on Danger Close who yeah. were from no, no, look, I didn't know any of them actually. So it didn't come up in conversation like we have Lincoln. been in the same environment. Yeah, no, wink, but, wink. but nobody that I worked with, like I didn't. Yeah, mm. yeah no, we didn't actually reminisce at all. I mean, I, I, I think we, we were all so focused on, mm. on, on making this film. Um, I don't, I don't know why we didn't come up, but it just <laughs> didn't. Um. Well, there's some fodder for the next time you all meet up and have to do team bonding. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Home and away. Yeah. <laughs> Great memories. Well, sick. Well, to wrap up, tell me one thing about you that I don't know that I should. Over to you, Nick. <laughs> I'm excited. I want to know when is when. What's your star sign? What's the last meal you eat? What's your favorite song to sing? Um, yeah. Do you walk with the right foot first or the left foot? Do you brush your tooth? <laughs> you brush your teeth with toothpaste first, or do you put the water on it? I'm ex like, what? Tell me everything. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> um, no pressure. Bottom theme. I think right foot first. I'm not sure. Hang on. Good con oh, it's left. It's left. left. There, there we go. go. It's left. There Never we mind. go. Left. See, 50 50 chance. Yeah, you know, I think I I'm right now that you're right. Here right. <laughs> 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 we go. Jesus. I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be right. I'm like, yeah, it's I right. Yeah. I really want to do it. Yeah, okay. Fair. All right. Well, that's. Anything else to add? Um, What's your favorite bread? Favorite bread? Mm -hmm. I like brioche. Great. Big fan of brioche or uh, hala. I like hala bread. Baguette. Really? Big fan of a baguette. Intercontinental. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time out to chat. I really, really, really appreciate it. Give it up for the boys, please. Thanks, Thanks guys. Appreciate and make it. sure you catch Danger Close August 8th. We did it.